Well, good morning, friends. I'm Mark Milwee at Trinity, Alabama, Mount View Baptist Church. Uh, today we want us to continue our study through God's Word with a lesson from uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 48. So as you know, that's right in the heart of the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And, and our uh, lesson uh, today, I've given the title, uh, Character is More Important Than Reputation. Character is more important than reputation. I think you'll quickly see uh, why I gave our lesson that title uh, today. Uh, now, as we get started, let me remind you that uh, Jesus has just challenged us in the previous verses to be uh, be salt and light uh, in our world, to, 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 to make a difference in our world by, by being uh, different. Uh, uh, so as we get started today, I want to share a quote with you. Uh, this, uh, uh, listen to what someone says. They says, reputation is that which people are believed to be. Character is that which people really are. Now, let me repeat that because it's important to our discussion uh, this morning. Reputation is that which people are believed to be. Character is that which people really are. I believe this sets the stage for what Jesus is trying to communicate uh, in our text uh, this morning. Jesus is much more interested in who we really are rather than what people think we are. Uh, for instance, the Pharisees have made an art form out of promoting good uh, self-image uh, based upon outward appearances. Uh, 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 you know, th 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 that's all they cared about is what people thought uh, about them. But, but Jesus elevates the call of discipleship in, in this portion of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the Pharisees, like many of us, well, they, they felt pretty good about themselves because, you know, they could say, well, you know, I haven't murdered anybody or I haven't committed adultery. I haven't left my wife. I, I love my neighbor, but Jesus says doing those things, well, that's just the beginning uh, of being his disciple. He elevates the call of discipleship by, by getting us to see the principles behind the commandments. The principles behind the commandments help us understand why it's so important to follow the commandments. Um, for instance, I might tell, uh, you know, one of my children, you know, don't touch the hot stove. I mean, that's the commandment or that's the basic idea that I'm trying to get across. So, uh, the, the, but the principle behind the command is don't touch the hot stove because I love you and, and I don't want you to get hurt. I don't want you to get burned. Uh, well, the same is true in all of God's commands. He gives them to us to protect us from danger and harm, either physically or spiritually. So, for instance, when Jesus says in our text today um, uh, uh, that <clears throat> in relationship to the law and prophets, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them, he means I want to bring us back to the original purpose of the law. The original purpose of the law was to protect and preserve God's people, not to punish God's people. There, therefore, what we need to understand is that God, in his infinite wisdom, established a standard for right and wrong. And if we want to get the most out of this life, then we've got to live our life according to God's standard and according to God's plan. Jesus didn't come to undo everything that had been done in the Old Testament. On the contrary, Jesus came to elevate this standard of righteousness. Uh, uh, that's why I want to begin this section of our uh, study today in an unusual place. I, I want to start with the very last verse of this uh, text, this passage. So if you have your Bible, uh, look with me there to uh, chapter 5, uh, Matthew chapter 5, and look all the way to the end of the chapter to verse 48. Notice what it says. You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, well, I, I might as well turn this video off right now because I'm never going to be perfect, and there's no use even trying. I mean, it's just too hard. God's demands are too high. But let me put your mind at ease. The, the Greek word uh, translated perfect comes from a word that means mature. It means complete. It, it means fully grown. Therefore, when Jesus says be perfect, what he means is be mature in your faith. Strive to be whole in your faith. Strive to be complete, to be fully grown, to, to be an adult Christian. Don't be satisfied with uh, just being a babe in Christ. Strive to be a true disciple. I mean, after all, this is what the Sermon on the Mount is really all about. How to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. 
For instance, uh, Jesus started uh, this sermon by telling us how to be happy by doing his will, by making sure we're doing the things he's telling us to do. And, and then he uh, told us to be an example to others, to make a difference by being different, by being salt and light in the world. And now Jesus, the master teacher, is giving us concrete examples of how to be a disciple in our everyday life. He begins by telling us that he is raising the bar on discipleship. Look at verse 17. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Uh, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, listen, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I imagine that the first listeners uh, 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 responded to these words exactly the same way that we would. The, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, well, these guys were the professional clergy of their day. I mean, you could say they were the pastors and the seminary professors of their time. And, and so Jesus says, if your righteousness does not uh, supersede theirs, then you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, I believe Jesus says this not to discourage us, but to uh, help us to realize what's really important. <laughs> uh, he's more interested in who we really are than who others think we are. He wants us to be wholeheartedly uh, committed to him. For instance, I read where Oswald Chambers once uh, wrote, he said, One life wholly devoted to God is of more value to God than 100 lives simply awakened by his spirit. Again, let me repeat that. That's a great quote. One life wholly devoted to God is of more value to God than 100 lives simply awakened by his spirit. The, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they looked religious on the outside, but Jesus knew what was in their heart. It's not enough just to know what the law says. We've got to do what it says. And this is the crux of the matter today. Most of us already, listen, we already know more about the teachings of Christianity than some people will ever learn. But the key question is, is it making any difference in the way we live our lives? Are we allowing the Word of God, the teachings of Jesus Christ, to impact our life in a personal way? Throughout this passage of Scripture, Jesus moves from the impersonal to the personal. He doesn't let us skate around the issue by blowing off the commandments as irrelevant. He hits us square between the eyes and waits to see how we're going to respond. Uh, let me share another quote from Oswald uh, Chambers. He says, if we're going to live as disciples of Jesus, we have to remember that all noble things are difficult. The Christian life is gloriously difficult, but the difficulty of it does not make us faint and cave in. It rouses us up to overcome. Well, I certainly hope that is true in your life. Jesus is calling us to rise up to the occasion and allow his word to impact our lives. Uh, many of his words I'm going to share with you today are difficult. I mean, they hit us where we live. Uh, Jesus wants to shake us out of our comfort zone, and he wants us to be a true disciple. Uh, look, for instance, at what he says, verse 21. You have heard it said of those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hells of fire. Well, as I said a moment ago, most of us, you know, uh, we're like the people that first hear this sermon. We hear the preacher say, do not murder, and we feel pretty good about ourselves because, you know, I've never taken anyone's life. But Jesus doesn't stop there. That's just the starting point. He, he, that, that, that's why uh, he says, you know, that, well, that's what they formerly said. But I say to you, don't even get angry. And then he continues to say, if you call your brother an idiot or a fool, you're in danger of the fires of hell. I mean, he is really getting personal. How many of us could say that we've never been angry or that we've never said something that we should not have said? Uh, but we've got to look at the principle behind the commandment to understand why Jesus says this. The principle or the reason why Jesus says this or gives us this command to not get is, is so that we won't get angry and lash out at our brother is because he wants us to be in a right relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I know that because of what he says next. Verse 23, so if you're offering your gift at the altar 
and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. I've always found it to be very interesting that Jesus says, if you remember, if it comes to mind that somebody has something against you, then you take the initiative and you go and you make things right. God is much more concerned about reconciliation between brothers and sisters than, than about our ritual, religious rituals and practices. In fact, uh, he seems to be uh, implying here that you can't really come and truly worship God if you've got some sort of ongoing, unresolved conflict with a brother or sister. We need to act quickly to settle differences and disagreements before they get blown all out of proportion. Uh, Jesus then reiterates this in verse 25 when he says, Come to terms quickly with your accuser. So the point is clear. You can't be in a right relationship with God if you're in a broken relationship uh, with others, especially your brothers and sisters in Christ. But next, he has a direct word for me. And look at what he says, verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Of course, this is not just a word for men. Uh, it takes more than one willing partner to commit adultery. Uh, adult, maybe we need a definition. Adultery is sex outside of marriage with someone other than your spouse. It's wrong. It's sin. And if you are involved in it, you need to stop and you need to go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his mercy and forgiveness. It's shocking to see the number of people today who've tried to rationalize this behavior away and act like it's not a big deal. But you better believe it's a big deal to God. Our sin matters to God, and we should never take our sin lightly. But here again, most of us, you know, we say, well, I'm not, I'm not committing adultery. I've been faithful to my husband. I've been faithful to my wife. But then Jesus hits us between the eyes when he says, if you've even looked at a woman with lust in your eyes, then you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. The principle behind the commandment is that Jesus wants us to live a pure and a holy life uh, before him. He wants us to be clean vessels that he can use. He goes on then to say, if your eye causing you to sin, uh, pluck it out. Or if your hand's causing you to sin, chop it off. He says it would be better to be uh, maimed than to spend eternity in hell. And of course, he's speaking figuratively there. He doesn't expect us to be hacking off body parts. But he is using this strong language to stress how serious uh, we should be uh, about living a holy life uh, before God. But notice what he says next, verse 31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a sick certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, you know as well as I do that the divorce rate is skyrocketing in our nation, and I'm also fully aware that some of you have suffered through the devastating effects of divorce in your own life. What family hasn't been touched in one way or another uh, by divorce? But the teachings of Jesus are very clear. He is clearly saying that the only permissible reason for a couple to get a divorce is marital unfaithfulness on the part of either spouse. If your spouse was unfaithful to you and left you for another woman, or if your wife ran off with another man, then uh, he's telling us there's nothing wrong with you seeking a divorce. But if you just decide that you're going to bust up your marriage for some other reason, then Jesus has some really harsh words for you. He says you're committing adultery and you're causing your wife to also commit adultery. I mean, there's just no other way of reading it. Uh, in fact, I've looked for other <laughs> explanations. Uh, Jesus even says it stronger in Matthew 19, verses 8 and 9, when he says, uh, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorced Divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Therefore, uh, God hates divorce. Divorce is very serious in God's eyes and should never be entered into lightly without every effort being made to try your best to make the relationship work. Uh, marriage is intended to be a lifetime commitment, and God wants us to keep our commitments. But now look at what Jesus says in verse 33. Again, you've heard it was said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all. Uh, the primary concern behind this command is honesty. We need to be people of our word. That's why Jesus goes on to say, let what you say be simply yes or no. 
Anything beyond this comes from evil. Uh, people who are honest don't have to swear. Uh, people will know we're telling the truth because we always uh, tell the truth. Uh, several years ago, I was uh, visiting a church member in the hospital, and as I started to leave, I went by the gift shop so that I could get a clergy pass uh, for the parking deck. Uh, this was the standard operating procedure at this particular hospital. So as I um, <clears throat> asked the lady for a, uh, a pass, uh, you know, a clergy pass, uh, she didn't believe I was a pastor. This was, like I said, this was years ago. Uh, I was much younger then. She, she thought I looked too young to be a pastor. And so... Uh, I, you know, I explained to her, oh, yes, I'm a pastor, you know, and everything. And so what she did then is she handed me two parking passes. Well, I happened to notice what she did, and, and so I quickly gave her one back. And she said, aha, now I know you're a pastor because you're honest. <laughs> and so I was so glad that I noticed that she gave me two, and I gave one back because, you know, people are watching our lives and that's why we always need uh, to be honest because, you know, you never know who's watching. Uh, so you would think by now that Jesus has been personal enough, but he just continues to throw out challenge after challenge. Uh, look at verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Well, again, the underlying principle in these commands is to be generous, to be kind, to be merciful, uh, to, to be loving to everybody that you come into contact with. Uh, don't always be looking for ways to seek revenge. Instead, uh, Jesus says, turn the other cheek. If somebody wants what you have, he says, just go ahead and give it to him. If a soldier forces you to carry his gear one mile, uh, which was a common practice in Jesus' day, then go ahead and carry it two miles. Uh, give freely. And listen, don't hold on too tightly to the things of this world. This calls us back to what we said earlier, be different and make a difference in the world for Jesus Christ. Now, uh, this long section of scripture ends with Jesus saying this, you have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Again, Jesus is calling us to a higher standard of living. He is calling us to grow and mature in our Christian faith. He is concerned with who we really are rather than who we appear to be. As the quote I shared earlier said, reputation is that which people are believed to be. Character is that which people really are. Listen, our character is much more important than our reputation. We need to be the people that God has called us to be from the inside out so we can allow the love of Christ to flow through our lives. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching today. God bless you.